I am the CEO of the Atlas Society, the leading nonprofit organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in creative ways. Today, we are joined by Bill Whittle. I've been looking forward to this for a long time before I even get into introducing Bill, a man who needs no introduction. I wanted to remind all of you who are joining us on Zoom, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube, uh, go ahead, start typing your questions into the comment section, and we are going to get to as many of them as possible. So Bill Whittle is a Renaissance man. He is a writer, a film director, a pilot, and a political commentator who focuses on American history and conservative values. He is the co-host of Right Angle, and he has a new video series entitled Moving Back to America. Uh, he's also the author of Silent America, Essays from a Democracy at War. It's a collection of personal narratives reflecting on current events and political philosophy. Bill, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Jack. Good to see you. So, uh, Bill, you actually titled one of your more recent episodes of Moving Back to America as Going Gulch, um, obvious reference to Atlas Shrugged, a book of which we are both a fan. Um, in the episode, you described the book as, quote, the most astute, brilliantly understanding uh, of how the left works and their morals and their lack of morals, a masterpiece of psychology and prediction unparalleled when it comes to describing the people who want to be left alone so that they can improve their lives versus those who want to tell people how to live. Um, tell us a little bit about your Ayn Rand origin story and why do you feel that her writing remains relevant, perhaps uniquely so today? Well, it was pretty recent. It was 2012 I, or so, I guess, um, 2012 when I uh, started reading Atlas Shrugged and I just finished it uh, last week. Uh, I read three or four uh, hours a day. It's a, it's a bit of a read. Uh, the, the reason I joke about that is because I don't think anyone's ever packed so much um, philosophy, and that's really the word for it, into a single story. Uh, the, the timelessness for me personally doesn't so much come from the plot. Uh, obviously, when you're dealing with things like railroads and reared metals, there's a little bit, it's a bit dated in terms of uh, today's environment. But what, what she seemed to capture was the quality of the people that are determined to bring down people like Hank Reardon uh, and John Galt, the kind of people who we tend to think of as perhaps in, as parasitical. But the impression I got from Atlas Shrugged is that they, they're not even parasitical, they're predatory. And, and the ability to, to say that we are doing this for the common good, for the little guy, for the poor person, is, is simply camouflage. It's just, it's just like leopard, uh, spots on a leopard. This allows them to basically take whatever they want in the name of somebody else. And just as one of, of uh, uncounted examples that we could come up with, uh, I think the city of Los Angeles, uh, where we both live, has dedicated, I, I wanna say it was 165 million a year, it might've been more than that, $165 million a year for the last four years to build something like 3000 apartment complex, number of apartments built so far, zero. So that's getting to be real money. You're talking about pretty near a billion dollars. Where, where did it go? Well, we know where it went, but nobody's asking these questions anymore. And, and the idea that you should be responsible for your own life is, is to me, it is the most, it's the most liberating idea there is on the planet. This is the idea that we should be taking as conservatives or libertarians or objectivists, whatever. We should be aggressively promoting this message uh, throughout the country, but especially to minorities, because they're the victims of this, of this uh, scam. And and if you can convince somebody that it's possible for them to be a motorboat, not a raft, that you have an opportunity to, to navigate uh, your way through life and go where you'd like to go, that's an incredibly valuable lesson. And just, just real quick, the reason I named that particular episode uh, going, galt, uh, going gulch instead of going galt, when people in modern society talk about going galt, they're talking about the productive people dropping out of society. But that's not what happened um, in Atlas Shrugged. 
It's true they dropped out of society, but they didn't just disappear. They all went someplace else. And they went to a place where they are where they are working with each other, dealing with each other and so on. They didn't stop producing. They just stopped producing for someone else. So when I suggested that we should be thinking about going gulch, what I really mean is given how effective uh, these uh, collectivists have been at destroying the trust in all of these institutions, we really should be doing business amongst ourselves, amongst trustworthy people who have a healthy respect for hard work. Well, I, I, that's a really interesting distinction. And I do get that question all the time um, when I do my weekly Instagram takeover is people say that they want to go galt or that they want to uh, withdraw or at least stop providing the sanction of the victim. But where can they go? And you and I were just talking pre-show about all of our friends and neighbors and colleagues that have left for Texas, for Colorado, for Florida, um, and yet you're staying. So how, how, do we, how do we actually go gulch? I mean, that's something that we try to provide at the Atlas Society, creating a community, creating forums, but, but how, do we, how do we do that in, in real life? Well, the internet taketh away and the internet also provideth. Uh, we, as, as, a, as a political movement, and I started out writing a blog called Eject, Eject, Eject. And somewhere around 2003 or four, somewhere in there, maybe a little bit later, we all realized, hey, all the eyeballs are gonna be in one place. When I had my own blog on my own domain, I had to count on a big linker site like Instaponent or somebody to send me a link, then I'd see a big spike in my traffic. And then along come uh, Facebook and then uh, YouTube, and we began to realize, hey, all of the eyeballs are in one place. Well, the problem is, is that all the eyeballs are in one place on somebody else's private property. And those people have values that are antithetical to freedom. And they are they are misusing their private property rights. We won't get into the details of, of big tech's uh, pretty egregious uh, transgressions, but suffice it to say that the internet is in fact unstoppable if you are willing to set up your own networks. The thing that I heard about this that I thought was the most profound thing I heard about this kind of thing came from, uh, was, it, was it Thad McCotter? many, many years ago, he basically um, held up a, one of these. And he said, this is the end of uh, government as we know it. He said, using one of these, I can make a phone call. I can order steel from China. I can make a reservation. I can conduct business with people all around the world, person to person. And there's no way that the government can control that. And, and he's absolutely right about that. We, we have an uncanny ability to march directly into the other side's killing fields and just stand there and just launch these frontal wave attacks against pillboxes. They've got their artillery zeroed in and they've got air support and they're dropping napalm. We just walk right in there and continue to walk right in there. But certainly in this age and given the intelligence level of the people who, who, who get this kind of stuff, and the thing about this kind of stuff, by the way, is it doesn't take a great intelligence level. It's very simple stuff. That's something I keep coming back to. This is not a big, tough equation to understand. This is just E equals MC squared. But certainly people can start to form their own connections. And, and I suspect, to be honest with you, Jag, these things will build themselves. That's what happened with the uh, Dan Rather uh, memo on uh, George Bush in the 2004 election. CBS put up a, a a supposedly authentic memo from uh, presumably Bush's former uh, commander at the Texas Air National Guard saying that Bush was AWOL. Well, he made the mistake, CBS made the mistake of posting that online. And somebody realized immediately that in the memo, which was supposedly written in 1967 or something, it was talking like uh, the 1167th Air National Guard. And, in, and after seventh, it had little tiny TH, which is, nice way of doing things if you're a printer. But if you were typing on a typewriter, that would have been a normal T, a normal H. This document is fake. Another guy printed the exact memo out in Microsoft Word without any changes whatsoever, spat it out, overlaid them one-on-one -on -one, uh, reproduction. Now, I bring that up because I watched that happen in real time. And it's kind of like watching proteins assemble. People would come into this thing with their own expertise. They'd build their own network they'd accomplish what it was they seemed to accomplish. And then these things kind of fall back into the soup. If we can get, if we, that process is, is certainly there. 
And I think all we really need is some kind of a, like a, like some, something to start some accretion. Just, just get the idea out there that we can do business amongst ourselves. And frankly, any business that you, look, if I'm a dentist and, and you're a, a, a contractor and I want a second um, bedroom on my house and your kids uh, need uh, braces, then there's gotta be a way for us to work something out that doesn't go through the rapacious clause of people who have nothing to do with that transaction except take most of it away. So Bill, um, you know, you mentioned we're both here in California mm -hmm. and talking about uh, feeling alienated from um, a current environment and, and some of the wasteful policies, really theft in, in this case, um, money that was, uh, was taken and, and then um, just redistributed to, to bureaucrats and not for the purpose for which it was promised. Uh, have you been watching the recall and um, do you have thoughts on its prospects or any of the, uh, the people that are coming forward um, in, in terms of running uh, potentially against Newsom from, uh, from a Republican conservative um, stance? The only person that I, whose name I've heard bandied around, I don't believe they've declared, and I certainly don't want to declare for them, but the only person that, whose name is heard, that I've heard discussed that I would be 100% behind is Larry Elder. I actually introduced him at the first speaking event I was ever uh, attending. He's a guy who um, would make an excellent governor, and he's a guy who could win election as governor because Larry Elder, like Rush Limbaugh, the great late uh, Rush Limbaugh, and, and anybody else in this business, has to defend these ideas every day. That's what they do for a living. That's what I do for a living. It's my job to, to make arguments that people will buy. And I think he would be an excellent choice. But the thing, you know, the thing about, about Gavin Newsom that people really have to ask themselves, and, and frankly, I watched, the, I watched the election where he was elected governor, and I watched the Republican candidate there, and I'm gonna observe Reagan's 11th commandment and speak no ill of Republicans, but seriously, that, that candidate, uh, had been through the de charisma -izer a few times. If I was going to run against Gavin Newsom, I would never, ever, ever make a public statement, and I certainly wouldn't get into a debate with him without first making a very big point of checking my smartphone to find out the easiest way to navigate the streets of San Francisco and avoid the human feces and, and uh, drug needles on the streets. There are apps now for your smartphone to help you navigate through the streets of what is arguably the most beautiful city in America, maybe in the world, because of the concentration of human feces, you need an app to get around the worst of it. And I would ask Gavin Newsom on a daily basis why his city needed that. And now why does the entire state need this? Our number one product here now in California is poverty. That's the thing we manufacture the most of. And, and to get into a debate on, on the finer points of this, is to completely miss the boat. When you're dealing with people like Gavin Newsom, you've got to go right up to him and kick him right square in the unearned moral superiority. Just give it to him right there and never, ever let them go. I would ask him continuously, I'd never stop asking him, why is it that, that, you, that the city that was under your care and all the people like you, and why is it that the people of your party, all of these once magnificent cities are absolute war zones, murder pits, and so on. You know, if you take inner city violence out of the American murder equation for the country. America is safer than Belgium. It's safer than Switzerland. It has, the, it has essentially the lowest murder rate in the world. But we continue to put up with this because these guys continue to lie and we just keep walking into the same defenses. We should just go right at them and say, hey, 8,000 black people a year are murdered in your cities under your watch. And if you look at Hiroshima today and Detroit today, and compare them to pictures of Detroit and Hiroshima in 1945, you'll see that Detroit has become Hiroshima and Hiroshima has become Detroit. And, and these are the kind of things that they can't escape because they're issues of philosophy and morality. But we continue to play this game of, uh, well, you know, uh, they want a 12.6% uh, raise in the tax, but we only want an 11.9% raise in the tax. We should be talking about why there's a tax in the first place. Completely agree. And I want to uh, remind those of us, those of you who are watching us on various platforms, uh, go ahead, start teeing up those questions. It's not every week that we get to uh, have a conversation with someone who covers the waterfront, um, politics, 
philosophy, morality. So, uh, so please start uh, submitting your questions and we will get to them. So um, I had not heard that, Bill, about Larry Elder uh, potentially. I, it's on- just a rumor. I, I, and, and Larry, if, uh, if people call you about this, I apologize, but not really. Well, we should Because I think you'd be an excellent an governor and you ought to run. I'd and I think you owe it to the country and the state especially. I think, I think that's very, very exciting. I uh, loved his, his recent um, documentary, Uncle Tom, and, and would uh, recommend that to, to anyone, I believe, who can find By the it. way, I, I'm virtually positive this was Larry Elder. He ran for, he was going to run for either governor or one of the uh, monopoly senators in the state several years ago now. And, and he was ready to go. And he would have destroyed, I, I cannot remember if it was, I think pretty sure it was either Diane Feinstein or the other one who's, who I blocked out. Boxer? Yeah, that one. But he went to the, uh, to the California GOP and said, look, I think I can beat these people. And the California GOP have this, this brilliantly articulate man who happens to be a black individual because that's the game they're playing now. If they have to play that game, then that's the game they're playing. And the GOP, basically, my understanding is, said, no, 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 thanks. If we're going to win, we have, to, we have to have a woman. We have to have a woman to beat a woman. And this, this kind of acquiescence to, to a rigged game never causes me anything other than grief and disbelief. When, when year after year after year after year after year, a uh, Republican candidate goes into debates that are moderated by the most left-wing partisan uh, people in the world. Why we continue to agree to this is actually a sign of what I think is the main problem with our society right now, which is Stockholm Syndrome. Well, you had talked about that actually uh, in, in a recent episode. Um, you mentioned in, in a, I think one of your right angle episodes, um, we are seeing more and more of these murals, um, painted plywood on storefronts. I certainly, I spend a lot of time in San Francisco with my parents and uh, I saw all up and down Polk Street while I wasn't dodging uh, excrement, um, all of these murals for Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, please don't, you know, please don't loot us. We're on your side. Uh, And you equated that with, with Stockholm syndrome. I hadn't heard it put quite that way. Can you elaborate on that metaphor? Well, I'd, I'd be happy to. And by happy coincidence, I did my mornings, uh, this morning's Moving Back to America show about this with a new wrinkle. For those of you who may not be familiar with the expression, Stockholm syndrome refers to a psychological uh, reflex, a psychological outcome. When, and it comes from a situation where there was a hostage situation in Stockholm decades ago now. And what the psychologist found was that these people essentially, either literally or figuratively for a week or something, had a gun to their head. And what they discovered was that the hostages began to identify with the hostage takers. And after three days, they weren't just identifying with them, they were demanding that their, that their um, needs be met. Now, this is the important thing to understand about Stockholm Syndrome. They weren't pretending to agree with the people that had put a gun to their head. They genuinely believed it. And the psychological motive behind this is, is relatively clear. If if there's somebody who's got a gun to your head and you're fairly convinced that they're going to kill you, the smartest thing that you can do is to make yourself as much like them as possible. Because if you can make yourself as much like them as possible, stands to reason that they'd have less reason to kill you. And that's what Stockholm Syndrome is. But I was reading a tr- an incredible, I'm in the middle of an incredible book called The Destruction of the European Jews. And, and uh, I- incredibly researched book. And the author wrote a, a line that really shocked me. And this is what I talked about today. He said, once the, the Jews had been uh, dehumanized enough and, and terrorized enough and brutalized enough so that they were in the ghettos, once they were in the ghettos, when the Germans would issue a command, they would, they would leap to it. And when they issued the idea that they had to wear a big star in front of them and back of them, there were lines. There were lines of people. They wanted to be the first ones to wear them. And I I wanted to know why people were going along with something that is so clearly not in their interest. And the author described this as anticipatory compliance. And that's what we're seeing all throughout society. When somebody boards up a store, when there's a riot going on and somebody boards up a store, and I saw hundreds of these and so did you, and they spray paint, we heart BLM exclamation point. That is anticipatory compliance. They are showing the people that have a gun to their head that they are one of the good ones. 
uh, that they can be counted on, that you don't have to necessarily uh, loot the store because we're down with the movement. Well, the movement's not, not about uh, black lives because if it was, we'd be dealing with the 96% of black lives taken in this country, which is inner city crime and not the 4%, which is police of any circumstances whatsoever. So, so what, what these BLM murals and posters, but especially when the buildings were first boarded up, I drove down Ventura Boulevard. It got fairly close to where I live. At least the boarding up of the buildings did. And certainly two out of three buildings had that some form of we support BLM. You know what that is, Jag? That is taking blood and, and smearing the lintels of your house, right? That, is, that is, is marking your house so that the angel of death skips over you and goes, takes the next guy. It is anticipatory compliance. It is basically saying to the mob, we are on your side and you don't have to burn and loot our store because we're, we're this close to burning and looting those other guys' stores. And, and that's what we saw when you have a brutalized population. And I, and I was wondering, why is it that if get woke, go broke is such a truism, and it is, why is it that Coca-Cola had, had this, you know, try to be less white. And then today I saw, or yesterday I saw Budweiser going through this kind of thing. And um, Disney is telling its employees that the white employees are going to have to kind of approach it for the black employees because they're too stressed out over the whole thing. So why are, why are pro-family, pro-American businesses like this doing this? And the conclusion that I came to, I thought was really pretty, pretty spot on, if I do say so myself. The idea of progressivism is that you do things to appear virtuous. It doesn't really matter if they work or not. In fact, it's essentially irrelevant. As long as you do the things that you're supposed to do in order to appear like a good person, like a good liberal, then you're in your club. If you digress from this, then you're not only out of the club, you're, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, when David Mamet basically wrote an article, I think it was in the Village Voice, saying, I'm, no, I, I'm a conservative. I've just, I've just been looking at and this is what I see. He lost 98% of his friends, just gone. All of a sudden, the reviews of his plays are talking about how he's kind of overdone, oh, all, of it, all of it. When, when the CEO of a company like Coca-Cola brings in that kind of diversity thing, he's doing it out of a sense of anticipatory compliance. He is rushing to put the yellow star on his arm. And the reason he's doing it is because if it, if it becomes perceived that the CEO, forget the company, that the CEO is not a good liberal, then he will be excommunicated and his entire identity is, I'm a good person. I'm a rich person, but I do good things with my money, see? And if you take that away from that guy, you have robbed him of his identity. You have essentially, I don't wanna overstate the case because I don't wanna define down the gas chambers, but you are essentially saying you are no longer a person. If you are perceived to be somebody who's not on board the program, you're a non-person. You have died in, in some significant way. And so all of these CEOs and the people who, small business owners who, who are furious at the idea of people smashing windows and destroying small businesses, nevertheless, anticipatory compliance. Mark the, the thing with blood so that the angel of death knows that, we are, that we're, we're one of the good ones. And the problem with this, among many problems, is the more of this you do, the more of this you get. Yeah, no, and I've, I've been feeling that for, for a long time, actually, going back to when I was in, in grade school in Massachusetts. Um, so, you know, this is 40, 50 uh, years ago, and, uh, and it was starting then. And it was um, just uh, this, this racial consciousness that we were being uh, impressed on. And I, I just thought that was totally not the, the, the message of treating people as individuals and, 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 and not being conscious of what group that you are in. And of course, it's completely antithetical to, uh, to the message that Ayn Rand um, promotes, which is the individual first. Absolutely. Um, and and not, not the collective, certainly not the uh, the, the racial collective, which she, she called racism, uh, the lowest, most crudely primitive form of, of collectivism, a stockyard or, or barnyard version of collectivism. Right. And we're now um, living through the new racism. Just, if, I just want to elaborate on one yeah. thing you said that I think is really important, and that is that this has been going on for a long time. The first time I ever had a thought that you could consider to be political, 
was when I saw, I was probably six or seven years old, I saw a picture of a line of people, uh, line of Jews lining up. It might've been at Baba Yar. And, and they were in line and they could see that there was a front row of people. And there were a line of German soldiers with rifles and they were shooting them and they were going into a pit and there was a long line of people. And it seemed to me two or three guards. And I asked my dad, who was in the uh, U.S. Army, he arrived in Germany in April of 45. So he, he got there just the war ended. I asked him, why are they doing this? They can see what's going to happen. It's not like maybe there's something around the corner. They're watching, they are in an assembly line for death there on the, uh, on the abattoir uh, runway there. And I couldn't understand it. And he couldn't understand it either, but I understand it a lot better now um, because you don't start with the gas chambers. That's where you end. The, the reason you can have people become that compliant is because they've been so brutalized for so long and, and the entire idea of resistance has been so antithetical to their existence for so long. So in the, in the case of the Jews in Germany, the first thing that happens is they take away the licenses of the medical professionals, professionals and, and the lawyers. Okay, well, they're rich, no big deal. And then they start saying, well, you can't marry other Germans. Okay. And then they start saying things like, well, you can't go to parks uh, and you can't ride the train and you can't be out streets after a certain hour. Now you have to wear an armband. Now we're going to put you into a ghetto. And then when they take you to the death camp, they strip you stark naked. And it's, a, it's an ongoing step to continually keep up this sense that you are the other, that you are uh, not only the other, but you're the evil other. And when you do this long enough, you will get people to line up for, for, for the execution. And I absolutely believe that is what they are attempting to do here. Uh, the Second Amendment provides us with uh, a, a defense that prevents them from taking the same road that the Nazis did. But the problem with that is, I mean, I used to be a heavily armed individual until I lost all of my guns in a, in a tragic boating accident uh, the day that uh, Joe Biden was inaugurated. Uh, but uh, the, the, we worry that they're going to come and take the guns because we know the guns protect us against the government. That's not how it's working. And that's not their plan. They're never gonna come and take your guns. What they're gonna do is they're gonna make movies and TV shows and video games and all the rest so that your grandchildren will voluntarily hand your guns into the government in order to get the pat on the head, in order to, to, to participate in the anticipatory compliance. They, they don't have to come and take the guns. All they have to do is to continue to spread these stories and, and these uh, lies, and your grandchildren will voluntarily turn them in with a smile. And if we don't understand that the battlefield is in the culture war and, and in the storytelling war and not in the ammo war, then we're gonna lose this fight and I'm determined to do what I can to not let that happen. Well, I uh, do not have children and I do not have grandchildren. I do have um, guns and-, uh, and, no, and I, think, I think you lost your guns in a tragic boating accident as well, didn't you, Jag? Uh, perhaps, perhaps. You were, you were out on, I, 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 I seem to remember you saying to. they all fell overboard. You were taking them somewhere out of Malibu and, and a big wave hit and they just went overboard. I don't have- Yeah, I must have been away. surfing, surfing uh, while uh, playing target practice. That's probably what happened. Yeah. Um, and I still haven't been able to get my NRA sticker off the uh, off the door there. But, um, but for me, it's really, always been the reason I previously had guns uh, was, was not about protecting myself from um, the government, but protecting myself because I know the government won't protect me. And uh, I've learned that um, having had my house burned down here in Malibu and, and been through multiple fires here in Malibu and knowing that um, the, the fire department will, will not be coming and saving um, your house or even attempting to defend it. And in fact, what they will do is they will come and take your volunteer fire department truck away and take your water away. So, uh, so I guess well. there is that, that other aspect of, of the going gulch, which is, uh, yes, finding people to have, um, to have commerce with, to have community with, but also to, to be reliant um, for whatever may be coming because uh, we can't rely on, on the government to protect us. No, that we, get, we get that, we, uh, just super quick, we get that from TV shows, you know, from, from all the TV shows we're watching, Adam 12 and Dragnet and all these other things we watch growing up, the FBI, all this stuff. We get the sense from these, from these dramas, 
written by writers, these pieces of fiction, that the police will come and rescue us. But they never rescue us. The police hardly, almost never, arrive in the, in the middle of a crime. The job of the police is to come and draw a chalk outline around your body and then try to figure out who did it, um, which is of cold consequence to you if you happen to be in, in the chalk outline there. So the thing that, that I think is most important is is to simply not only be bold about, about this position of ours, but to be brazen about it. I mean, seriously, we're the side that has, you know, fast cars, loud guns, and hot women, honestly. And we can't sell that to the American people. They're the party of, of, of gray, drab, you know, sustainable algae cakes and, and people picking fleas off of each other around, you know, burning dung patties when they raise money for the Guatemalan water snake or whatever the hell they're doing. We're the people that are talking about, you know, candy apple red, 66 Corvette Stingray convertible on Pacific Coast Highway with the Beach Boys on the radio. And I cannot for the life of me understand why it is so hard for uh, traditional Republicans anyway to to botch such an easy sale. Well, and, you know, we've been hearing a lot of commentary about this recently. Bill Maher has been. Uh, he's yep. really cru cruising for a bruising there, um, talking about, hey, what, what happened? Um, that he's not comfortable with this, this uh, role reversal uh, that, you know, the, the Democrats, the left used to be the kind of anything goes and we're the party of fun and uh, the Republicans were the, the scolds. And mm -hmm. now with uh, cancel culture and safe spaces and trigger warnings yep. that uh, the shoe is on the other foot. And and you have um, also in talking about education, I think another one of your most uh, recent episodes, um, you talked about uh, the increasing use of incomplete grades for courses taken during COVID and also um, the increasing use of trigger warnings for literature that students might find offensive. Uh, and you, you talked about how this was possibly one of the worst things that, that we, could, we could do to students, depriving them of that aha moment and uh, depriving them of an ability to build resilience. So uh, what are some of the consequences of such measures that we should be considering? Well, it turns out that the things that we always knew to be true, the things that Anne Rind knew to be true, are true because they're true. And they have been true forever. And as long as human race is made out of this stuff, they'll continue to be true in some form or another. So there's actual biological explanation for this. And it, it's got to do with a part of your brain called the amygdala. Now, progressives try to say that the amygdala is the fear center. And as it turns out, scientific studies have shown that the amygdala is a little more developed in people who call themselves conservatives than people that call themselves liberals. But the amygdala, stay with me folks. The amygdala is not a fear center. The amygdala is a warning center. And to give you the best definition of this I ever heard, the job of the amygdala is this. If you are walking down a pathway in the jungle you're a, or, or in the mountains, you're a hunter gatherer and you hear the snap of a twig behind you. And the next thing you know, there's a panther on your back. If you survive that experience, the next time that happens to you, all you have to do is hear the twig snap. You don't have to wait for the panther. The amygdala has learned that that is a threat signal and you respond immediately. One guy who fell through ice could never walk across a parking lot after that without feeling a panic because every time he stepped on a tiny little puddle, he knows it's not going anywhere, but it's the sound of that cracking ice just, just sent him. Now, we all remember a story maybe seven, eight years ago where they shut down an elementary school and called in the SWAT teams because some little boy had chewed a Pop-Tart in the overall general shape of a pistol. This caused the people at the school to panic. And one thing I've known from the uh, SEALs that I've got to know, and I've known a few of them, is that they don't panic over the sight of a chewed up uh, Pop-Tart. And the reason that they don't panic over the sight of a chewed up Pop-Tart and the reason that they don't need safe spaces for an idea that they may not like is because they have to deal with actual threats to their life on a daily basis. What that simply means is this. If you protect people, if you try to protect people from, from unpleasant stimulation, then the amygdala simply never develops. And so what happens is, is that the threshold, the panic threshold goes down and down and down and down and down. 
a friend of mine who's a SEAL, if somebody started shooting at him in a small room, that'd get his adrenaline up. Other than that, not too much. When people get adrenalized and have panic attacks over everything, it's because they have never had to deal with or work through any of these threat responses. And this is what play is, by the way, and this is why play is being eliminated too and why you can't win or lose in a, in a baseball game. I played Little League Baseball. First year I played right field, we went 0-10. Second year I played first base, we went 10-0. and I'm not saying it's because I switched positions, but that's historically what happened. And, and winning my first baseball game would not have meant anything like what it did to me if I hadn't lost the previous 10. And losing a baseball game and dealing with the uh, with the just the kind of the shame and the sadness and the depression that comes with losing a little league baseball game teaches you, stimulates that amygdala, basically says to you, okay, this is this isn't good, but you survived it. And and next time you lose, you take it a little bit better. You don't want to get so good that you that you like losing, but you get my my drift here. By by giving students, young people, safe spaces. What we're doing is we are maintaining them in a state of perpetual infancy where any stimulus of any kind causes them to go into full on emotional meltdown. And that is child abuse. That's really essentially like Chinese foot binding for the soul. You know, it's, it's like taking uh, it's like taking a person's emotional health and character and and artificially constraining it in this tiny little box when it should be growing for the for the. Uh, fashion pleasure of those people doing the constraining. And that is going to bite us real hard. What we should be doing is we should be challenging these kids as much as possible. I don't want to blow their circuits because it's not their fault. They didn't ask to be raised this way. But they should be constantly challenged because the more challenged they are, the more capable they are of dealing with a challenge. And if you are concerned about, uh, as a parent, and you don't want your child to drown, let's say, you can go two ways. You can either hire a lifeguard to be with them at all times and legislate for, for uh, fencing and locked doors and, and lifeguards, and every single body of water has got to have a gate and a passcode and all that. You have to protect yourself against all those things, or or you could teach your kid how to swim. And, and those are the two ways of, of doing that. And we are so determined to go down that first route because we somehow feel that exposing a child to any kind of negative uh, interaction of any kind is bad for them. It's not. I, I, I know this sounds controversial, but I think one of the biggest problems with our society today is that the kids who are growing up now never were allowed to go out and get hurt. You know, I mean, back in my day when we were, you know, writing with sharp sticks on pieces of clay, uh, you would routinely fall out of a tree or you'd get on that circular thing at the, at the playground and you'd whip it up to some insane speed and go flying off and bang yourself up a little bit. But those things got you used to failure, pain, uh, surprise. Uh, I, I don't want to go too deep in the woods here, but, you know, we learn through um, uh, heuristics. And that's the idea that once you learn something, you don't have to learn it again. You can build on top of that. So a heuristic might be if I put my hand on a red hot uh, piece of iron and burn myself, then I don't have to do it again the next time I see something red hot. Heuristics tell me that that's probably not a good idea. So, yeah, I... so we can't. So how can you build on people's experiences if you don't give them any? It's um, what you're saying reminds me of, uh, we had a couple of guests on the show previously, Lenore Skenazy, uh, who is the founder of the Let Grow movement and free range kids. Uh, and, and she, and also another guest, um, Greg Lukianoff, who's the uh, co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind, pointed something out, which uh, I had not even thought of it this way. You know, we're, we deal a lot, a lot of the students that are involved as Atlas advocates or on college campuses um, and are very much in the minority. And I had always assumed that uh, this was always a one-way pressure that was coming from, um, you know, woke college professors and administrators. But in fact, uh, to, to some degree, uh, the administrations of these schools though definitely they are uh, completely on the left, they are reactive to what they are finding, which is a mental health crisis, which yep. they have on their hands 
of uh, children who are who are extremely uh, much more neurotic um, and suicidal, suicidal eating disorders. Uh, yep. And all kinds of uh, dysphoria, Allergies. Yep, identity, yep, yep, you know, yep. confusion. Yep. Uh, but but in part was stemming from this this experience, which was in part media driven. Uh, that at some point in the in the seventies, uh, we became obsessed with threats and dangers that you know uh, we we absolutely couldn't let our children go out and play. Um, alone because they were going to get snatched and, yep. <laughs> and trafficked yep. or whatever, and just blowing these things out of proportion. Way, and way out of proportion. And, and, not, and we're seeing something similar today with other threat to public health that's being blown way out of proportion to maintain high fear levels. Now, you're absolutely right. And I recall reading uh, David Horowitz's book called uh, Radical Son. And, and I remember reading that and and we talked a minute ago about incrementalism, about how this stuff just happens slowly over time and just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. But you, I, I think you can make a pretty strong case for, for a, a marker where it started. In other words, all of this stuff that we're in now, all of this trouble, can you put a pin on, on the first event? What was patient zero in this woke uh, pandemic of ours? And I think, I don't know what the year was, I wanna say it was 67, 68, somewhere in there. A, a bunch of students broke into the Yale library, might have been the Yale Law Library, and issued demands. And the university acceded to their demands. And that's when it started. Because if you break into a university library and trash things and start issuing demands, then the answer to that, especially since they're not armed, is to send police officers in there, arrest them, expel them, file charges against them, and everything's fine after that. And they'd be minor charges and they'd learn their lesson. Their little amygdala would get tickled and they probably wouldn't do it again. But that's not what happened. The faculty backed down. The faculty gave in. And to me, that is the earliest one that I could find historically. If they had not done that, it would have happened somewhere else. It's a symptom of the culture. But nevertheless, when, when a university allows the library to be taken over by, by violent thugs who are making demands and they not only... Uh, they not only succumb to that, but actually kind of agree with them. Everything after that is just very predictable. All right, we have some questions here. Right. Actually, lots of questions. Uh, okay, Ben Poser, devil's advocate question. Sure. Why is prosperity good? Poverty, particularly pre-modern poverty, enforces action, practicality, importance of family. Um, if good times make weak men, then why should we have good times? Well, that's, that's actually the, the tough part of the question. Uh, the, there's a saying that I heard just a short time ago, a couple of years ago that I like very much. And, and, and this is the story of human history. Uh, smart, uh, strong men make good times. Good times make weak men. Weak men make bad times. Bad times make strong men. And this is this is the pendulum swing. So let's deal with the first one about why, why should there be prosperity? Um, when, when Americans look at the third world, they're, they're often amazed at, at how the same problem would continue for generations, centuries, in some cases in millennia, without being fixed. And P.G. O'Rourke, another big influence on me, was talking about seeing this, I wanna say it was in the Ukraine. He said, well, it's not a racial issue because we're dealing with Caucasians. And the reason I know they're Caucasian is because they live below the Caucasus mountains, the Caucasus. But he said in this village, in this Eastern European village, there was a sewer that ran down the middle of the town and had been there from, the, from time immemorial. And, and PJ used an expression I'll never forget. He said, any real American knows that, that he could take $200, go down to Home Depot and solve this problem forever in a, in a half a day, but they don't do it. And I thought, to myself, what's wrong with these people? And then I realized there's nothing wrong with those people. They're not the freaks. We're the freaks. We're the freaks. We are the people that, that do things differently than have always been done throughout history. Poverty is the default condition of mankind. The ability to build things in, uh, I've forgotten his name, the author of Bridge Over the R River Quiet, the French author, 
was talking about this. You, you, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen the movie, a bunch of prisoners of a true story, a bunch of British prisoners of war are sent into the jungle and they end up building this bridge for the Japanese, a railway bridge. And the British determine that the way they're going to show the Japanese that they've got their dignity and that they're actually better than the Japanese is to be building a bridge that they couldn't build. The author of this book says that, that, the, that the Western mind did something that that the Japanese mind hadn't done or, or nobody in the area had done or, or was even really aware of. And, and the term he used was, he said, they built the bridge in their mind first. Before they, before they even walked out of the camp, they had built the bridge in their head. They knew how many nails they were gonna need. They knew what kind of lumber they were gonna need. They knew how long it had to be. They knew how, how, how stiff the soil had to be. They built the bridge in their head where you can easily make changes. He spread it around with a bunch of people. And this idea of building something in your head and then making that thing come true is some kind of freakish genetic mutation in the human uh, species. And it fortunately, fortunately, is a contagious uh, condition. This is not a biological issue. It's not a racial issue. It's not got anything to do with any of that. It is simply an idea and a set of practices that can be learned. Uh, and, and the ability to create a better life, to create wealth out of thin air, because that's what happens, you know. The, the, the fundamental difference, at least economically, between uh, individualists and collectivists is collectivists believe that there's a pot of money that has to be divided up. And if somebody's got a lot, that means that he took some from somebody who's got a little. Uh, people like us believe that it's not a, you, want, you want to divide up a pie. How many pies do you want? We'll get you a thousand pies. You want 10,000 pies? We don't care. We'll just make some more pies. But, but this is the fundamental idea is that, is that you should be able to live the, you should be able to live your maximum life, right? This isn't a dress rehearsal, Jag, you know? And so many people go through life like it's a dress rehearsal or like if they keep the receipt, they get to, you know, they get to start again. It doesn't work that way. This is it. And, and you as a conscious person have a right and you could almost say you have an obligation to to make your life as pleasant as possible. And by pleasant, I don't mean necessarily sitting on a golden you know, couch and, and having somebody drop the peeled grape in your mouth. Hey, don't put, don't uh, knock golden couches. Oh, sitting on one. I, I, uh, <laughs> please, please extend my apologies to your couch. What, what, what's interesting, I think, and, and again, more, more form of child abuse in our society today, uh, and I didn't know this until fairly recently, but the, the, the Greek definition of happiness, true happiness, soul happiness, they define that as using all of your powers to their maximum ability. That's what they said constitutes genuine, actual happiness. And I remember I, I had her name and I've just plain lost it and I apologize for this. But I remember watching the woman scientist in charge of the Ingenuity helicopter that we landed on Mars. And I remember seeing her work on this for 10 years. And I remember her expression as this telemetry came down, rotors are going, yes, we've lost contact with the ground. Yes, we've done a turn. Yes, it's at an altitude. Yes, it's landed safely. Yes, and she just leaps out of her chair. And I said to myself, you know, very few people are gonna be as happy as this woman is right now because she has invested so much into this that, that it pays off. She has used her abilities which are considerable to their maximum. And, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to do that. Whatever it is you do in life, if you do it well, gives you a sense of achievement and, and, and contentment that is unattainable anywhere else. And to deprive people of that is, is to rob from them. It's to steal from them the potential, not, not just to make money and not just to buy nice things, the potential to, to feel the, the fundamental happiness of having a goal and achieving it. I've had a chance to know personally quite closely, I know at least three or four millionaires, close terms with one of them passed away recently is practically my dad. And certainly in the case of these gentlemen, none of them became millionaires because they went out to make money, none of them. 
the one I just mentioned was a was a geologist. He was trying to feed a family of, of six on twenty three thousand dollars a year in 1973 in Florida. And he figured out a better way to do carbon 14 dating. It was all three. It was faster. It was cheaper. And it was more accurate. He went to the university, he said, do you want to be a part of this? He said, no, 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 we're doing just fine. Started his own company. Now, Beta Analytic does 94 percent of all of the carbon 14 dating in the world, for which he received several million dollars for providing a service that people needed. But he never did it to make money. He did it because it's what he was passionate about, what he cared about. And, and this is being absolutely fenced off from today's kids. You cannot compete. You cannot excel. You cannot can claim credit for anything. Everything is a team. There is no responsibility, and therefore there is no success. And it, it's, like watching, it's like watching an entire generation die of scurvy, you know? It's, that's what it's like. It's like, this is so unnecessary. Give these people a flipping orange, will you? And their teeth won't fall out. Let them do something. Nope, nope. We're going to deprive them of that vitamin in order to make them compliant. And when this dawns on people, if it dawns on people, we should see a different kind of government than we've been seeing very recently. I think what you're raising... Uh brings up sort of a tension that I sometimes feel within the liberty movement. Um, we at the Atlas Society are objectivists, we're, we're open objectivists. So we, we believe in um, an open debate and believe that, uh, that we can build on the ideas of Ayn Rand as we have that debate and, uh, and, and new information becomes uh, available. But, um, but sometimes in conversations I have with libertarians, you know, that we get this sense of, well, it's really value neutral. It's just kind of leave me alone and anything goes. And I, I do feel like that leaves out something that, uh, that we try to promote within, um, within the Atlas Society. It's these values. It's, it's achievement. It's productivity. Joy. It's joy. It's, it's That's what joy, it is. Joy, gratitude. It's, it's, you know, uh, that, that um, enjoying yourself is is great, you know, but destroying yourself is not is not part of the, the deal. And uh, and that when you say that it's almost a, a duty, um, that it that it is. I mean, we do have, I think, a, a at least a, a opportunity. And it's almost like, gosh, if you fail to take advantage of that opportunity to to live up to your highest potential, it it, it does seem like uh, it, it's it's a, a bit of a crime. We have another question that was submitted early by Cindy Liu, uh, who says, hey, Bill, I'm a longtime fan and follow of your work. Thanks for all you do. Thank In you. your opinion, uh, what is the best method or approach for an individual who wants to see the U.S. Constitution respected and upheld uh, to have an impact on our culture? She would love to throw a wrench into the machine that is attempting to steamroll uh, dissent and diversity of opinion in American society. So what can people like Cindy Lou do? This one's easy. Um, I was uh, very honored and, and fortunate to be, uh, I certainly wasn't a central part of the Tea Party movement. The reason the Tea Party movement was so great because there was no central part to it. But I, I, I have spoken at about 100 Tea Party events, maybe in excess of that. And we thought that the answer to our problems would be to send politicians to Washington who had our values. But generally speaking, with exceptions that you can count on one hand, the fact that they're a politician means that they don't have our values. And so the answer to your question, Cindy Lou, is uh, not one you're going to like. It's certainly one that I abhor. But the answer is actually pretty simple. If you want to save the country, you got to run for office. You got to run for local office. The, the election laws uh, that were so suspect during the last election were put in place on the state level by people who showed up. And this is our great mistake. And this is the great mistake in, in the entire idea of going galt. You think you can walk away from the government, but you can't. Um, you can say, I don't want anything to do with this system, but the system wants to have something to do with you. And that's the problem. It pursues you wherever you go. The entire idea of, of a republic as opposed to a democracy is that, is that it, it is an obligation of the citizens to be able to govern themselves. And you cannot have free people unless you have fundamentally virtuous people. If people more or less, more or less, if most people are good people, you can leave them alone. If they're not, then you gotta 
then you got to have prisons and surveillance cameras and police and all the rest of this stuff. So when we talk about how out of control the government has become and how all of these protections for us have been eroded away, the reason that's happened is because we have let them own politics. And even to the degree that there is a Republican Party, for the most part, for the most part, the Republican Party is essentially the party that says, ah, well, you see, the Democrats want a 25% tax raise, but we only want a 19% tax raise. And nobody gets to the heart of it. Nobody gets to the moral core of it. This country was designed to be run by citizens. And if it was up to me, I would say everybody in this country should be eligible for office and and there should be term limits, and the limit is one term. You go to Washington, you go for two years, you come home. By the time you've been there for two years, your information is already obsolete. You no longer know what your neighborhood needs or what it was looking like. And if you if you committed to like, no, I'm, there is no re-election in our party. If you were to commit to that, then there'd be no influence of big money or big labor or anything. Most politicians spend their time getting re-elected. I know somebody who spoke to John Boehner, you know, the conservative, uh, and 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 said, uh, my my. The, the, the story comes to me second or third hand, but basically said my uh, nephew is one of the incoming uh, freshmen here at the United States uh, House of Representatives. What do you think his first priority ought to be? And Boehner said, re-election. That's it. Fundraising, re-election. Why? Well, so that you can ride this horse for another two years. Cindy Lou, the, the, the country lives in, in the heart of people like you. And, and if people like you and me because this is all my fault when you get right down to it. it, really is. I'm the one who saw this happening. I didn't do it nearly enough. But the idea of the country and freedom lives in the hearts of people like you and, like, and in the hearts of people like the ones watching this program. If you think that good people can walk away from government because government is ugly and stupid and still have a good government, well, that just doesn't make any sense. If the good people walk away from government, then the only people left in government will be the bad people. And if you need further evidence of that being the case, I can't help you. Uh, that's exactly what's happening. So I would say run for office. You know, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but some significant percentage, like 30, 40 percent of local elections aren't even up for, there's nobody, there's one person running for the seat. There is no competition. And on the local level, you knock on a hundred doors back and turn the boat. That is how you build uh, an organization. That is how you basically go to your state legislature and vote for voter IDs and, and reasonable and effective integrity for the election system, for example. But if we continue to, to walk away from it and say, I don't want to do it, uh, that's appropriate, but that's not going to go. I think, frankly, my rule of thumb is this. It, as far as politics are concerned, if somebody wants the job, they can't have it. Well, um, perfect timing, Bill. That That is all the time that we have. Well, that flew by. Um, I, I, I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit more, but we'll have another chance uh, to, to talk a little bit about uh, aviation. And hopefully sure. we will have uh, the chance to do that with mutual friends, um, one of the previous uh, guests on this show is Michael Walsh, uh, who has left us here in uh, in L.A. It's Michael somebody. Walsh is a lying, drunkard, no good son of a gun. He is absolutely one of the most miserable, awful people that I have ever met in my life. And it is an enormous pleasure and honor to be his friend. And someone who, I guess, also taught you a, a thing or two about uh, flying. So, um so we will be hopefully gathering with Michael and um, with Bill and with other pilots such as uh, last year's uh, Gala honoree, Peter Diamandis at our gala coming up in Malibu on November 4th. Um, Cindy Lou, of course, another way to throw a wrench into the machine or at least pass along some of the wisdom to the next generation is to get involved with, uh, with the Atlas Society. We, uh, we are focusing on passing along this, um, these values, impacting, projecting our values to the next generation in ways that that generation uh, finds engaging, graphic novels and uh, animated exactly. videos, exactly. Things, exactly. things like that. Um, and Bill, how can we continue to follow uh, your work? Uh, I know we sign up on, on YouTube for uh, the, your series and, um, and your show. 
how do we keep track of you? You're all over the place. Oh, well, well, yeah. Um, the, um, we run a membership based business here and a relatively small number of people have uh, paid nine ninety five a month to become a member and have, I didn't do this calculation, but somebody did. I think the, the videos that I've done in association with my, with my colleagues here at billwhittle.com, I think the number is 60 million views. And, and that's a, that's a real number. Um, and a very, very small number of people not only make these videos available for everybody for free, but insist upon it. They don't, they wouldn't even take members only shows They said, just get it out there. So if you're, if you're of a mind to support us with that, we'd love to have you become a member at billwhittle.com or you can make a one-time donation if you'd like. I've, I've always felt awkward making an appeal like this because it's just how I was raised, I guess. But nevertheless, this is where the fight is. And and this is where, where we're going to win or lose, and that's in the field of the pop culture. So uh, we certainly could use your support. And for those of you that are supporters and have been for a long time, uh, like Cindy Lou and the rest of you, thank you so much. And we just promise to keep doing the best we can with the money you give us. Well, thank you so much, Bill. And thanks all of you who have been watching and have been with us throughout this past year of 52 episodes. It's hard to believe. Great. I hope you will join us next week. I'm going to be interviewing a dear friend of mine, Randy Wallace. He is the screenwriter and creative force behind Braveheart and We Were Soldiers in Pearl Harbor and Sea Biscuit. And uh, tomorrow, join us for our premiere on a new platform. Um, I'm going to be on Clubhouse at the Atlas Society Club. Uh, with Grove Norquist, who was, uh, we talked about patient zero. He was patient zero. He was guest number one on our first webinar. So um, see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. if you are on that platform. And again, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bill. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>